question there. It's been a long while since uh, I put another video up, but it's such an important video, this, that I couldn't not do it. And uh, we've left Scotland for driven out by the snow and the wet wind and the rain and come to London where there is no snow but there's wet wind and rain but it's not quite so cold so we're pleased to be here. Now what is so important I can tell you that immediately there is a, uh, a multi-millionaire in Las Vegas uh, called Bigelow. Bigelow has made a lot of money and he's very interested in traveling into outer space and he's building rockets and things like that. But he's also interested in moving into inner space in a sense. And so what he did was he said he would give half a million pounds to the best essay on the continuation of life or continuation of consciousness after death. And he put that uh, title out in the press and he got over a thousand people who said they wanted to take part. And uh, he uh, said there was to be no religion but it was all to be science. So this was going to be the scientific case for life after death. And the next thing that he did was he said um, he looked through the thousand people who applied and he only took those people who worked in the field. So you couldn't uh, just decide that you knew all about this and that because you knew all about it you would um, therefore make a, a good essay. He, no, he wasn't interested in that. He's wanted interested in those people who had studied and probably even researched the possibility of life after death to put an essay in. This meant that the essays that were put forward were very high quality and it cut down the thousand applicants uh, to just over 200. So uh, was I interested? Yes, of course I was. And I was interested with two of my colleagues. One uh, was called uh, uh, Pietro uh, um, from Italy. And Pietro uh, is a quantum physicist. And then there is Vasilios from Belgium and he is uh, another um, physicist, so two physicists. And then we had uh, somebody called Martin Redfern and Martin is an ex-BBC producer. So he's very good at wrapping things up in a story which makes sense and which uh, everybody can enjoy reading. What we didn't know, or I didn't at the beginning, is that Vasilios is also very good at uh, drawing cartoons. And so he, it, one of his cartoons was, um, uh, I, I'll show it to you actually, I won't show it to you this time, but I may show it to you next time, is a man sitting at a desk, obviously giving a, a, a lecture, and it's obviously Caesar and another man comes up behind him and stabs him in the back and Caesar turns around and says and you again Brutus so it makes a nice cartoon so uh, everybody beavered away at this and the results are now now out and first prize goes to uh, Jeffrey Mishlove now you must do this look up his podcast thinking aloud thinking aloud and you'll find he has some amazing people that he's interviewed then next came a dutchman pim van lommel he got a hundred thousand and uh, he's a cardiologist from holland he's he's um, a really knowledgeable cardiologist and he had people in his unit who had near-death experiences 
So that makes good sense as to why he should have become interested in the subject. And then third was uh, Leo, who was from uh, who's from the UK and is uh, an official in the Psychical Society. So he's obviously been in the field for a very long time, and he got a hundred thousand. So. Uh, there were then, I think, nine prizes of 50,000 and then all those essays which were fantastically good, but not as good as those who'd been awarded a prize. And I think the judge find it very difficult, were given an honourable mention and our essay was in there and given an honourable mention. And with the mention came $20,000. Well, that's not bad, is it? So. Thank you, Mr. Bigelow. That was really a very kind offer, uh, which we're grateful to accept. And thank you very much to the judges for seeing that what we'd written was in fact not too bad. Certainly worth an honorable mention. So why am I making such a fuss about this? Because this is the first time such a huge body of academic literature has been collected and put back together on the question of life after death. And so uh, we include the URL of the Bigelow Institute uh, in the uh, title of this uh, video. And you can, in fact, if you like, go to it and I would recommend it. And all the essays are there. And uh, Mr. Bigelow has decided that these would be bound up in very attractive binding and sent around to libraries uh, in the USA. I hope libraries elsewhere and also be available for hospices. And so this is a wonderful thing to do because it means that people who um, are in hospices and coming up to the end of life will be able to read the definitive evidence about life after death and uh, so will you and you'll all be able to make up your own minds uh, having read the evidence uh, that people put forward and I think um, I can say unequivocally that there is in fact very good scientific evidence for the possibility of life after death. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the entries was by a man called Michael Tim, and Michael uh, has written a book, 25 Reasons Why You Have to Believe in Life After Death. And the result of that is that um, uh, he goes through all the early literature. Do you remember all those people like Leonora Piper, the great mystic, uh, and one or two other psychics, uh, all in the mid, mid 1800s, who did wonderful seances. And they um, were, there were always two views, those who said it was fraudulent, and those who actually looked at the data and saw what was going on who felt it was in fact correct. And so when you judge these things, you must actually look at the data and find out about it. So let's um, just think about some of the early data. And one of the ones that I like very much is a seance which was held by uh, members of the Psychical Society and they tied the mediums down and put the lights on them so that they couldn't move. And this was the one which I may have mentioned before, which is certainly worth mentioning again, in which the uh, medium produced ectoplasm. What's ectoplasm? Ectoplasm is a substance which seems to come from the medium and either spread across the floor or take various shapes. Well, this was taking the shape of a person. And so they had the idea, and isn't this a cool idea? I mean, would you have thought of this? Getting the ectoplasmic shape 
to put its hand into a bath of molten wax. Now, molten wax won't burn you, of course, um, so it was okay to ask the ectoplasm to do it, I assume. Um, and this was exactly what the spirit, or the ectoplasm in the form of a spirit did. It took its hand like this, and it put it into a bowl of wax. Now, what happens? If it's real, if there's anything there, then it'll get created in wax, and that's exactly what happened. So they got the spirit to take the hand out, let it cool, put it in again, and four or five times until there was a good coating of wax on it. And then they suggested to the medium that they could now end the session, which they did. And the, all the ectoplasm was withdrawn back into the medium. Well, what happened to the hand with the wax? Well, the wax, of course, not being ectoplasm, remained. So what they did is they produced a perfect cast of a spirit hand. Now, of course, everybody's going to say they cheated, they put it in after and so on, but there were very rigorous controls, even to the extent that the experimenters put a coloured dye into the wax that nobody knew anything about. And indeed, in the hands, the uh, hands of the wax, uh, or the wax hands, uh, there was a coloured dye in it. So you have to accept that... Um, uh, it was the same wax that was used uh, during the seance. Now, um, what did it look like? Well, it looked like a human hand. It had the same sort of palmer creases, you know, you can see your creases there. Um, and so did this hand. The only thing of interest was it was a child's hand rather than an adult's hand, but it was a perfectly normal, properly formed child's hand impressed uh, or coated in wax which a result which was then cast after the ectoplasm had been withdrawn and the model was made of this child's hand and it is I think in a museum if I'm right I think it's in Brazil but at any rate it exists to this day now what's interesting is that in medium sciences now uh, very few people uh, can produce ectoplasm like the mediums of old could. And why is that? Well, I don't think the mediums today are quite so interested. And uh, producing uh, ectoplasm way back then was enormously important. So, what can we conclude from all this? We can conclude that some of the best scientific minds in the field have written comprehensive essays, not more than 27,000 words, on the continuation of life after death. And they have in fact enumerated different streams of evidence to support it. Well, what streams of evidence do you think would support it? What about reincarnation? Oh no, people don't possibly know. But then you haven't looked at the data, you see. The data is very good, they do know. There is uh, the case of somebody who's a pilot in his previous life. And uh, a lot of the reincarnation work has been done in the University of Virginia by Stevenson. And it's been uh, followed on by his, one of his colleagues and uh, Jim Tucker. And uh, Jim has been looking for uh, cases in America, whereas Stevenson's cases tended to come from India and so on, but then people argued, well, they of course had a belief in reincarnation in India, so we can't believe anything, but people in, in the USA don't, and you get very similar stories. And you remember that it's an important story because uh, the if usually occurs in people who have sudden deaths, they're either shot or run over. And the marks of the injury that occurred at the time they died 
do in fact um, reproduce themselves in the children even to the extent that somebody had their fingers cut off just before they died and the child was born with no fingers I mean it's a rather dramatic one but nevertheless some of them are very dramatic like that so you have to accept that reincarnation occurs how it occurs we don't know but that it occurs there's very little doubt um, then you go on to the evidence from mediums and seances are these really spirits well you have to uh, think a lot about this if you're interested look up the data Swedenborg is a, a, a Swedish philosopher who uh, was a poly, polyglot um, who was uh, extremely good at many different things languages etc etc and one of the things that he could do is he could get in contact with people who were dead he said and a, a, woman, a man came up to him in great distress no, there was the woman the woman came up to him in great distress and said um, there is a man who's come for some of money which I think my husband has paid but he says he's never had it and he wants it immediately so Swedenborg went into a trance state and spoke to the dead man interesting and the dead man told him exactly where the receipt was uh, so that also is interesting and now it is definitely checkable and he said that the receipt was in the desk and if you opened the desk and pulled out a drawer you would find a secret drawer at the back of that drawer on the side of the desk and in that secret door was the receipt and so the wife went and did that the receipt was there and so of course the man had to admit that he had been paid and had signed a receipt for it so a, a, a really interesting case so how did that information come so this is giving us lots of ideas about what the world is like and first of all what becomes very clear from this is that you can't use our ordinary everyday reductionist science because our reductionist science accepts no place for the spirit no place for transcendent experiences and uh, it just says this is all woo woo and made up and pretend well any of you and many of you will have had transcendent experiences and the last thing you you would uh, agree to is that these very wide experiences composed of light and universal love that you have are not made up they are not all woo woo they are in fact true experiences and now with quantum mechanics there are a number of theories which we we may go into later uh, which suggest that the uh, the world is interconnected every particle is connected to every other particle and so then you immediately say well what is the role of consciousness the role of consciousness now looks as if it's a universal uh, a un universal I call it a substance but we don't know whether it's a substance or not but it's a un universal uh, effect which um, allows people to understand and become aware of the universe that surrounds them so there's very little doubt that consciousness is not just secreted by the brain rather like the liver secretes bile no it's it looks as if uh, William James's theory of the brain which we've discussed before and is always worth discussing again the brain acts as a filter in other words there is a vast range of phenomena out there which we don't see don't smell don't hear don't know about because uh, of the fact that the brain is filtering them out and we see a very 
etiolated or reduced uh, picture of what's there. And that seems to be a very good theory because then it means that as the filter opens, then these wide transcendent experiences can occur. So uh, the, uh, the evidence from mediums and spirits and so on uh, is now really very good. So we've got reincarnation and we have got spiritual mediums and we have got, then there are things like deathbed coincidences, which again we've talked about on this program, uh, where at the moment of death, at the moment of death, the dying person visits somebody to whom they're closely emotionally attached. And they talk to them. Uh, they always, in fact, give them a message usually. And the message is, don't worry about me, I'm perfectly okay. And then, then they leave and go on. Now, if you, if you are mourning and you have that sort of experience, then you would um, obviously uh, be enormously supported by it and it make your grieving much easier because it means that they in fact will go on. It doesn't say that you're going to see them again, although it does imply it. Then of course uh, there are lots of other things like uh, deathbed communication. Now two views of this. One is that the uh, people who uh, have just lost um, a spouse or even a child will hear them and feel them once they're dead. And this has all been thought of as part of the mourning process. Well, yes, maybe it is, but it looks as if the data goes way beyond that. And it's so common. Um, on one study, it was almost up to 90% of people who had lost somebody had a uh, deathbed communication. Sometimes you feel your partner in bed beside you. Sometimes you feel the touch. You can feel as they come into the room, you can smell uh, their perfume. Uh, and of course, uh, you can talk to them. Some people feel that they can have really quite um, vivid conversations with the spouse or the person who's died. So it's not just um, the brain missing the person and producing it, it's, it's much wider than that. Let me just give you one, which is another one rather like the Swedenborg one, but again, it's uh, a, there is a very famous medium in Brazil called Chico Xavier, and that's Xavier with a, is with an X, X-A-V. And Chico was a young lad who came from a poor background, never educated, but yet started getting automatic writing at the age of 14 and continued and wrote nearly 500 books during his life. Um, automatic writing um, is when the hand moves of its own without any, um, without any impulse or consciousness of the individual. Oh, they're pretending, they're making it up. But they're not, because the brain functions differently. And if you do functional MRIs of automatic writing, you find totally different parts of the brain are used. So uh, it's not just making it up, it is in actual fact the brain working differently. We would argue now that maybe it's got a different filter in it. And so uh, somebody went to Chico when, uh, after their daughter had been murdered because the police wanted to know where her body was and so did the family and the police wanted to know who did it and so did the family. So Chico spoke to the dead daughter. That's what he said, believe it or not as you like, but yet it would be a remarkable coincidence if it wasn't true in some sense. And uh, what Chico found out was where the daughter was, was murdered, what she was wearing, 
and who did it? And this is in Brazil, and the Brazilian court has in fact accepted this as a um, as being worthwhile evidence, true evidence, and the police certainly acted on it, found the person concerned, found the body, and the person was charged with murder, and uh, the court uh, agreed, the judges agreed that this was so. So, woo-woo, very strange woo-woo if it is, at any rate you now have to say what you mean by woo-woo, if you're saying that these things don't exist then that's just not correct, if you're saying that people lie about these things that may be true, but then you must look closely at the evidence. So uh, you can see that the Bigelow Prize has in fact done an enormous amount for our understanding of is the consciousness persisting after death. So I would recommend you all go to the Bigelow site, you have a look at it, and uh, uh, then you can, on the vast amount of data which has been put forward now, you can make up your own minds. But if you look at uh, Jeffrey Mishlove's article and Pim Van Lommel's article and Leo's article, I think you'll agree that they make a very, very good case for a continuation of consciousness after death. So that's where we are. Well, I'll come back with some more interesting stories. I hope not we're back in London in the not too distant future. Nice having you with us again. Thank you. Bye.